in a year and a half, they wouldn't remember me.
those who feel disenfranchised from society, those who have lost hope, yes, truly, we are the embodiment of that dream. And we have a tremendous responsibility as educators at this institution to be true to the vision, to the work, to the struggles that Dr. Johnson made on behalf of this generation and generations to come so that we take our, our responsibility very seriously at Medgar Evers College. We are a college on the move. We don't intend to run with the pack or run behind the pack, but run in front of the pack. That is the only way for us to, to run, to run a sense of humility, a sense of justice, a sense that we are somebody. And so that we intend to be true to the vision. And this is a great occasion because there have been, there have been so many individuals who have struggled to make sure that this dream would come forth. And I'm proud to have been and to be the president and under our administration that we were able to get the Board of Trustees in the City University of New York to approve the dedication and the naming of this lecture hall. So we say to all of you who have worked hard, and all of you who come to witness this occasion, this is a glorious occasion. This is a happy occasion. And as our students come and go, they will always be able to know of the work and the life of Dr. Johnson because this lecture hall, one is named for him, and inside there is a plaque that depicts and outlines his life, his contributions to society. So again, it is with enormous sense of pride and humility that we welcome you to Medgar-Evers College and this great occasion. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. On behalf of the Community Council, we want to thank you for coming out to this important program. Norman Johnson was a civil rights leader, an advocate for the poor, and an institution builder. In fact, one of the institutions he built was the Community Council. It is a unique umbrella organization of students, faculty, alumni, community leaders that supports the Meg Rivers College institution and is the only body of its kind in the entire city university system. And this is one of the legacies of Norman Johnson. We are here to ensure that Mr. Johnson is enshrined in the pantheon of our leaders and heroes here today. And we are ever grateful to Norman Johnson, his son, and Miriam Johnson, who is one of the most dedicated members of our community council, for having you come out here this evening and share on this joyous occasion. Thank you so much, and let's move further on into the program. Gloria Mayers is a member of the CUNY board, first McGevers student to have served in the history of McGevers on that board. He's also a part of the New York State Higher Education Service Board and a recent graduate of McGevers College. Mr. Gregoria Mayers will say a few words. Thank you, Ms. Wattler, Dr. Edison O. Jackson, Ms. Johnson, elected official, members of the court, and of course, our distinguished students and faculty. It is indeed an honor for me to stand here today. Since looking back in terms of the struggle of our people, in 1968-69, when the community council and the late Mr. Johnson and other members were fighting or really put in the paperwork and struggled together to get this college founded, and now 20 years later, myself and other students from Central America, I'm from Central America, and other students from the Caribbean and part of the United States and the 50th state will come to this college with such distinguished faculty and staff. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I want to thank you. I want to thank the faculty, the staff, but most of all, Ms. Johnson, 
with deep respect and from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you again. And I'm sure you, you went through the struggle with your husband and the other members to get this college founded. And as Dr. Edison O. Jackson said, we're running in front of the pack. Thank you very much.
to work with him for the rest of his life. There are many, many things and experiences I could relate to you that I had with him, but I would summarize most of it from two points of view. Uh, first, I would say that Norman Johnson demonstrated beyond question that he had a commitment to this institution. He had a commitment for what it was all about, and he believed in it. As the president has said, he believed that Meg Evers would one day stand as a beacon of hope for those who needed an opportunity. Beyond that, the other thing I would say about Norman Johnson is he was a person who worked untirely. I happened to have an office that looked out over the parking lot and on any day at any time, it was very common to see Norman Johnson coming to the college to help in some way to address some problem that we might be facing or to address some need that we had. I often wondered whether or not he was married to Eggers College or Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> but his effort was untiring and he had that commitment. And I hope those attributes that he showed will stand as a legacy to us as we dedicate this room today. So Ms. Johnson, we thank you for the support that you gave him and for the support that you gave the college. And I'm sure that on this occasion it will stand as a monument that will long inspire us to bigger and better things. And now I call upon Dr. Robert Johnson, who was a former Dean of Student, former President of the Faculty Association, and who knew uh, Dr. Johnson very well. In fact, he shared an office with him. Greetings to all of the symbol. It was about 13 years ago that I was appointed as Dean of Student Services. And one of the first persons that welcomed me to the administration at Mary Harris College was Norman Johnson. In fact, Norman B. Johnson took me out to Monday's for dinner on my very first day in office, he and Mrs. Johnson. He told me about how much he wanted to be involved as a an advisor to the NAACP chapter at Medgarvis College. It turned out that Norman was here so often working in his advisor capacity that we shared the same office. Uh, I would leave somewhere maybe six, seven o'clock, Norman would come in. <laughs> and so that particular office was pretty much going, I would say at least 15 hours a day. Norman was a model in terms of helping young people. He was willing to take his time and work as an advisor to the Medgarvis College NAACP chapter. He got them involved in many important activities of the NAACP during his involvement. Uh, during my time in student services, I cannot think of another faculty or club advisor that was as dedicated to young people as Norman. Certainly his dedication is going to be a legacy. And we're all beginning to realize the dream that he and others founders had when they fought to institute this college. And it certainly is a privilege for me today to stand here and, and, and mention the fact that I had an occasion to work very, very closely with Norman. He certainly very much inspired me. He let me know that there were a lot of good people who were willing to give to see the students at Bad Harris College successful. And I'm sure his legacy, uh, with his name on this le lecture hall, will serve to inspire us in the future. Thank you.
28 years ago. So you see, that's older than mid ever. College, I mean, not that mid. <coughs> In fact, I was with the State Division of Housing when the pressure from the public, NACP, and similar organizations persuaded, I use the word advisory, the powers that be to set up a program within the Division of Housing to eliminate <coughs> discrimination against minorities in apportioning out the housing that was being subsidized or in other ways encouraged by government. One of the major <coughs> parts of that project was the appointment of a special council of nine distinguished citizens from all over the state to serve as the Intergroup Relations Advisory Council to the Commissioner of Housing. Norman Johnson was one of those nine. I will have to admit, I suggested him. I was on the executive staff of the division at the time. The policy of that council was to promote actively a policy of elimination of discrimination in housing. <clears throat> Norman, as has always been his own, not only promoted actively, but he promoted aggressively. I can remember any number of instances, which I will not attempt to tell you now because it would take too long, where we were all over the state meeting and uh, negotiating, and sometimes outwitting local officials in various parts of the state, many of whom had never heard of the idea that all people are created equal. But Norman was a very effective lawyer, he was a very effective arguer, and he was an extremely effective member of that council, and he was a great help in bringing about a situation which is at least improved, but by no means over, in the idea of making housing accessible to all people without regard to race, creed, or color. I think that was one of Norman's major contributions, but not the only one, because as all of you here know, and some of you will hear more about it from others, Norman was an, a real activist from way back, before the term was coined. And uh, when he got into this Medgar Evers creation, and he was one of the first that I knew to get it, he came to me and wanted me to get into it too. And I said I would do as much as I could. But I was not privileged, as Norman was, to take all of my time because I had a job and a family too. I did what I could for a while, and then I had to beg off and tell Norman, get somebody who can give more time. He did. He got a whole lot of people to tell him because this is one of the monuments to what he did. And I think, I can't say much more about Norman except that there are probably thousands of people around the state who have been to be grateful to him for making it possible for them to have access to decent housing, which they could afford. And I also like to think that there are many young people who either have found, are finding now, or will find in the future, in Medgar Evers, the educational opportunity that will enable them to take advantage of the opportunities that lie ahead. And in that sense, I feel that this is an occasion long to be remembered, very much to be created, and I think it will enrich the memory of Norman Johnson in a way that he richly deserves. <laughs> Thank you. 
my friend, you may have known Mr. Johnson any longer than I did. <laughs> I've known Dr. Johnson since I was a very young girl. And uh, his contribution to our people and people at large, not just black folks, but white folks, people of all kinds, Dr. Johnson was always there when you needed him. I think every young boy or young girl that comes through these walls and get an education will owe some of that to Dr. Johnson. I feel more wealthier for having known a Dr. Johnson than any other one single person I know of. He was a great man. And I think we have lost a great person. And I would just wish that somebody could take half of the interest in people that Dr. Johnson had. Dr. Johnson was the president of the Urban League in Brooklyn for a few years. He was honored by the Urban League in Brooklyn in 1970. Going back to World War II, Dr. Johnson and Charles Berkeley secured thousands of jobs for black skilled workers. Dr. Johnson was one of the first persons to go on radio and make an appeal to find black craftsmen jobs through efforts, black women, black people, and women of all kinds have been able to secure jobs in technical institutions where they were not able to secure jobs prior to his effort to help people. <coughs> one of the philosophies, one of my philosophies on this earth, if I can say I have helped someone, if I have done a quarter or any part of what Dr. Johnson has done to make this a better community, a better place for people to live, that Dr. Johnson made, I will think I am a great person. Dr. Johnson never said no. Dr. Johnson was in the courts. Dr. Johnson's have defended our black boys and girls. Just for a thank you. I don't think any lawyer can defend anybody now for saying thank you. It cost a witness to her. But Dr. Johnson was there. He was in the courts, he was in the schools, he was in the streets, he was everywhere. He was a downstate medical institution getting jobs for blacks when they were building that great institution there. Maudby Richards and Madge Ford and a few of the other people, Catherine Alexander and Dr. Johnson, was there. Thank God for having known in Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. I now call upon Mrs. Maddie King. Okay, moving right along.
uh, jo uh, Joseph B. Williams, not Ms. Bidet, but Joseph B. Williams. They were all incorporated as a corporation. And uh, we were glad to do this because the judges had been asking the lawyers, and especially Norman Johnson, to do pro bono work for the black indigent uh, males who had been in the courts. And so the justices were welcome, they welcomed the fact that uh, we wanted a legal services in the community. And so they helped us to get this legal service. They approved us. They were happy. And uh, we became affiliated with CALS, and we opened our first office in uh, 1968 at 1174 Street. Uh, we did the best we could, and Norman became a member, was elected to the board, and he stayed with the board until the time of his death. He also became the chairman of the board. He was there as the chairman. He was there a lot of days. And he often, he would do everything that he possibly could to encourage the students or that we had. We had law students that, we came, that came to work with us. And that he encouraged those law students <coughs> to stay with their studies so that they would become lawyers and could carry on what needed to be done the people of the community. And now we have some of those same law students who are judges. And Antonio Brennan is one of the judges. He's one of our law students. And um, it's, it's so nice to be able to look back and see what people can do. And Norman was one of our tremendous helpers. He helped us. He helped us at the time that the uh, when uh, the former president, Ronald Reagan, was trying to crush legal services. He was there to guide us as to how we could reach our congresspersons and our state's persons to crush that uh, force that Reagan was putting on us to try to crush us out and try to, to do away with legal services. And we won out. Uh, of course, we don't have the money now today, but yet still, we're still here. We're doing a little bit that we can. And uh, because we need more money, but uh, that's not here. You know, there we're here to honor Norman. And I know that his lovely wife of many years is proud, and his handsome son is proud that you are honoring Norman today. Thank you very much. Is there a Judge Jack Weinstein in the house? Judge Weinstein? I'm going to impose upon you to say a few words of uh, uh, to us. Judge Ryan Seen, U.S. Federal District Court, tried the famous case, uh, Brown versus Board of Ed, a civil rights case. This is the famous case. Thank you. 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 I've known some very distinguished men and women in the legal profession. I have the honor of working with two, Thurgood Marshall and Norman Johnson. And Norman Johnson's job was, in a sense, more difficult, I always thought, than Thurgood Marshall. Because Norman dealt on a day-to-day -day basis trying to bridge whatever gaps there were between the white and the Afro-American communities in this borough, which is an extremely difficult thing to do. And I saw him almost on a daily basis in the many ways that he tried to serve both communities. <coughs> been a source of deep regret to me that we have not replaced the one black judge we had on the Brooklyn Federal District Court, Henry Bramwell. I don't see Henry here. We're making every effort as judges to place a black person Afro-American person on our bench through the magistrates 
and we are trying to do the best we can to see what we can do in Washington to rectify what I consider to be a serious error. Because as judges, the fact that Norman Johnson was able to tell us what was needed, and that Henry Bramwell each morning at coffee was able to give us a relationship with this community, made it possible for us to serve much more effectively. When I was chief judge, I wrote repeatedly to the president of Met Gavis asking if we could get some students to come to the court and begin to learn from the ground up some of the profession. We have some 40% of our clerk's office who are black in this county, Afro-American. And it's essential that we improve that ratio and do more to help get the students who are coming out of this school into the leadership roles in our court and the other courts. Our court stands ready to cooperate by courses or by teaching or by any other way that you feel desirable. <coughs> Whether we will ever be able to get anyone as effective as a woman was in this respect, I don't know. But this kind of relationship has to be fostered. And it has to result in a community that will live together and govern itself together much more effectively. And it's for that reason, Mrs. Judge, that on behalf of the United States District Court, the Eastern District of Long Island, I feel deeply honored be here tonight and to speak in honor of your husband who meant so much to all. Thank you very much. When I see Karen, Karen Kendall Booth, I feel very at home because it's not often that I see the first graduates of Ben Evers College. And so one of my colleagues and here to make members together, Mrs. Carrie Kendall Booth. Good evening, Mrs. Johnson, my family, friends, all of our guests. I am very honored to have the opportunity to say a few words about this exceptional man. I first met Norman Johnson in 1975 when I started my career as a student here at Nick Evers College. He was an exceptional, exceptional individual. He was instrumental in getting the NAACP, a chapter here at Nick Evers, started. It started secondary to the controversy over the institution of tuition for City University of New York students under the umbrella of the NAACP. Norman Johnson got involved in many projects and programs. Among them, he felt it important to touch the children. One of the programs, and I hope that today it is still in progress, involved career day for um, elementary school students. Career day involved having businessmen in the community, judges, other professionals, etc., attend schools in the area for an entire day, sitting with the children, talking with the children, discussing with them ways and means of becoming uh, a professional. You should have seen the look on the faces of the kids. It was an important and effective, uh, they were important and effective events. In 1976, he also organized for members of the community and members of McDevers College and AACP to attend a fundraiser event for Andrew Young. Subsequently, Andrew Young was our guest speaker at our 1977 commencement. Norman was involved not only on the political front and not only with children. He was also involved with the student 
students at Mecca Evers College who were from abroad. He instituted programs to have students from abroad nationalized. We set up tables, we gave speeches and discussions about the importance of becoming nationalized so that one can vote. <coughs> instrumental in promoting the Billy Holiday Theater also here in Brooklyn. He was a man for all seasons. Unfortunately, humans have a way of uh, honoring our people after they've gone. Norman Johnson should definitely be counted among one of those men who lived before his time. Thank you. And now I bring you the Honorable William Booth, former judge of Kings County Court, former president of New York State NAACP, former president 100 black men. Thank you very much, Ms. Butler, Dr. Jackson, Miriam Johnson, Norman Johnson the fourth, G2 UC, I see you way back there. He 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 can always be seen. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel good because I think that uh, Norman is looking down upon us right through this, these windows here. And I think it's great to have this lecture hall right opposite this open uh, ceiling, sky, showing through. Because he's up there looking down at us and saying, boy, I wish I were there. Because that's the way he was. He wanted to be everywhere. And he was everywhere. He was the one who started, along with a few of us, the Brooklyn and Long Island Lawyers Association. We felt that uh, African-American lawyers had a hard way to go in the courts, and we did. We didn't have any judges to look up to, we didn't have anybody who could help us, and uh, so we wanted to organize ourselves. There were those who said that we were being discriminatory. But I pointed out that we had a, a Greek society, we had an Italian society, we've had all kinds of other societies of lawyers, and why not have an African-American society of lawyers? And Norman joined, and we were able to get a large number of members to join. Also, we had the Crispus Attucks Political Association throughout the state of New York. Crispus Attucks, remember? And we had the, uh, well, he was active with the state conference of the NAACP uh, before I was president and after I was president and while I was president. He was uh, active in organizing the political action committee. You know, the NAACP was said to be nonpartisan. Well, yes, that's true. But we were also supposed to be political, nonpartisan, not taking sides politically, but also we had a reason to be political, and we were. And he was also active with the 100 black men when I was president. We came here to Medgar Evers College and had an educational conference, which was attended by a large number of people, and uh, Norman Johnson put that on successfully. He's done so much for so many people, it's a wonder there are not more people here. But nevertheless, we've got enough, and I just want to join in the tribute to him, uh, to Norman Beaufort Johnson, and to Norman Beaufort Johnson IV, and to Miriam Johnson as well. And I think that uh, uh, Medgar Evers has done well uh, by having known, all of us have done well by having known Norman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we call upon Judge Edwin Torres. Justice in the Supreme Court of New York City and author of Q&A. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mrs. Johnson, son Tony, I was known as Tony. Uh, distinguished guests. Uh, when the heart is full, it is difficult to speak or articulate for itself. Uh, I will not attempt to augment here or add to the incredible host of uh, or side or enumerate the incredible host of achievements and attributes of Norman, Norman Buford Johnson. Uh, I would like to, if I may, momentarily touch on, on a more personal level. Uh, when I met Norman, going back 33 years, I was uh, I'm still living in the Bahia of Holland, Spanish Holland, where I'm from, born and raised. Uh, I got out of law school, but I was still waiting on tables and shrines, as a matter of fact. I've had a doleful period of my life. And Norman gave me my first job. And uh, I worked with Norman 
at that time the Legal Aid Society did not exist. I was only about 26 years of age, but Norman ran me ragged. He covered within the span of the year I was with him over 300 cases of pro bono work. Because in those days you were like Judge Booth, there was no retainer, saving homicides. And uh, it was largely through the intervention of Norman Johnson and his inspiration. He was my first mentor, the first professional person with whom I was ever associated with. And to me, he still looms before my eyes as, a, a, as, as almost a deity. And I have always, in the succeeding 33, 33 years, attempted to emulate him in, in every uh, aspect of his character that I could absorb. And it was through his intervention with the office of uh, the District Attorney of New York County, the late uh, Honorable uh, Frank Hogan at that time, uh, and it was through Norman's direct intervention with various political and ethnic uh, factors too numerous to cite at this juncture that I was able to get into that office. And uh, without seeking to, to, uh, to scratch my back, it was I was the first Hispanic, certainly Puerto Rican, appointed to the District Attorney's Office in New York County. And you cannot believe, uh, in, in today's context, uh, the significance of that. It made the front page of El Diario a job that paid $3,000 a year. <laughs> but in large, large measure, and I, and I, and I, I guess I'm re repeating myself, but in large measure, uh, and I believe it was uh, Miss Ford who alluded to, if you can go through life, and, and that caught me, my attention, if you can go through life and help one person, that in and of itself is a singular <coughs> achievement. Here we are celebrating a man who's, who, who, who acted on behalf and perhaps led the way, okay, for scores, for scores, innumerable ones. And this is one kid from the barrio, okay, who would like to hear it now, to render tribute and express my appreciation to a man who, when I was literally, uh, uh, the bottom step gave me a hand, mm -hmm. and I'm eternally grateful to the Norman and his family for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Perez. I'm going to call upon uh, Mr. Samuel Wright, Squire. Give an honor to our dignitaries here in the dais, ladies and gentlemen. I feel in a way that I know Norman Johnson better than most people in this room. <laughs> and I say that because as of tonight, I'm representing the NAACP down here. And Norman and I had been in numerous cases for the NAACP. And I thought I got to know the man very well. Norman has many faces for many people. Mm -hmm. But in those faces that he had, he knew how to extract the best from you and use that best to help people all across the state and our state. I am proud to have been associated with him. And I'll tell you something now that maybe his wife doesn't even know. Mm. Norman and I had decided that we would enter into partnership and open an office down in this part of the city. He thought that by being close to Mega Evers, that it would be good for us at the same time he could extract all the help that he could from that office which we had intended to open. I miss Norman, and in missing him, I know that he's looking at us tonight, as everyone has said. But in his looking, he was counting on all of you being here to help Mega Evans so that other people can recognize what has and had been done. And for that, I thank him along with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would now like to call upon the president of the student government, who came in just shortly, to say a few words to you.
Samuel Wright is being asked to make a presentation to Norman Johnson Jr. Uh, on his behalf and on behalf of the late Norman B. Johnson, uh, their lifetime membership in the NWACP, something that the former uh, Norman Johnson did not receive while he was alive. And the Johnson family is asking um, Samuel Wright to make this presentation. <laughs> I offer you this plaque, Norman Johnson IV, in behalf of your father for the many things that he has done to aid the NAACP in Brooklyn, in New York State, and across our United States. I shall hand it to your daughter. So that when it's displayed, not only will she know, but the time will come when all of us will know what it means to be awarded this deserving life. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to call upon um, a representative from the library department of McEvers College. He is representing uh, our librarian who was a member of our committee and helped us to put this uh, uh, tribute together, um, Dr. Suzanne Paul Nicolescu is unable to be with us today because she is a member of Representing uh, also the CUNY Asian American uh, Council. Yeah, at a meeting, a very important meeting today. I see the Asians are getting like like the uh, African Americans now, and uh, she's uh, unable to be here. But um, Reverend F. Goldway Cheryl of Grace Church, who is a very good friend of Norman's and mine, uh, presented us with a a book. Um, to serve these rights, which was a report uh, that his father was a part of. His father was Rev the late Reverend Henry Knox Sherrill, presiding bishop, Episcopal Church of the United States, who served on President Truman's uh, commission of civil rights, and uh, this is a rare book, which um, we call them both, presented to Norman and me, and uh, we in turn presented it to the Megan Evans College Library. And um, since Suzine could not be here, she has uh, Mr. Yastani to, to present uh, this uh, book, or rather to accept this book from uh,
My grandfather's family and the college family present these flowers to you in appreciation for your spearheading this wonderful tribute to my grandfather, Norman B. Johnson, J.T.
like to uh, give some comments. Mm -hmm. May I just direct you into what the rest of this program is going to be like? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'd just like to recognize Mr. Roy Abrams, who had donated several IBM computers to this college on behalf of Dr. Jackson. And I hear he's here, Mr. Abrams. <laughs> we will now ask uh, Robert, not Robert, but um, Mr. Johnson uh, Sr. to give a vote of thanks, after which time we will proceed with the ribbon cutting into the um, Norman Johnson Lecture Hall where there will be a blessing by the Reverend uh, Clarence Norman and the unveiling by President Jackson. And after that, we will proceed to have refreshments. I was just thinking, listening to the many accolades of you, friends, colleagues, and other family members of speaking of my father and I'm reminded when I was at the house hearing one expression he would always say, I've got to go to the college. <laughs> and I have something to do at the college. My mother would get a little ticked off at him because many <laughs> times we put aside a social affair she wanted to go to because he had to go to the college. And to have the Megavis College in the lecture hall after him in his memory, I think makes him a part of at the college. I want to thank each and every one of you, you old friends, dear friends, members of my family, to you, President Jackson, for your cooperation, to Marceline Wadler, Elsie Richardson, for your dedicated work and service and the many hours you put into putting this program together, a family, and I thank you very much. So now I'm going to, I hear some stomachs rolling, or rumbling. <laughs> so let me turn this back over to the mistress of ceremonies, and uh, we'll continue from there. Thank you. organized uh, some of the family, they call themselves, and there are hundreds of them, very prolific, uh, called uh, the Cousins. And uh, they, they have a newspaper and they take trips together, they have all kinds of things. I see quite a few of them here, and I would uh, appreciate it if you'd ask them to come out and if we could take a photograph. Very, very yes, would you come forward please, the Johnson family? The Cousins? Yeah. 
Receive us, thy servants, who rededicate ourselves to thee and to the work of thy kingdom. Grant that those who come here, whether administrators, teachers, or students, may come with pure minds, upright purpose, and a steadfast endeavor to learn to do thy holy will. As long as men and women shall gather here, may the memory of our friend Norman B. Johnson live in our hearts and our minds. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. Amen. refreshments in the next room and we ask you to remain <coughs> seated until the Johnson family goes out. Thank you very much. Did you want to say anything about the Thank you very much.